Thank you for your kind introduction. Hi everyone, it's great to have you all online. I'm very happy that you all could make it today. Um, I hope I'll be able to inspire you and provide you with some valuable input on how market research can help forecasting the impact of biosimilars in different market situations. I will do this by discussing the, discussing the following topics. Um, first, I will quickly touch base on biosimilar introductions, the uh, successes of biosimilars, um, factors protecting from biosimilar uptake, influencers on biosimilar uptake, and I will finish with an example of a case study. But before I would like to begin, I, I quickly want to make sure that everyone is aligned on the difference between biologics and biosimilars. So let me quickly explain them to you. Biologics are therapeutic proteins that are made from natural sources such as human and animal cells, yeast and uh, bacteria. Um, the active substances of biologics are larger and more complex than those of non-biologics. Then biosimilars. Um, biosimilars are developed to be similar to existing biologics. The, exec, uh, the active substance of biosimilars and the originator drug is essentially the same biological substance, although there may be minor differences due to their complex nature and production methods. Biosimilars are not the same as generics. Um, generics have a much more simpler chemical structure and are considered to be identical to their originator products. So having said that, let's move on. So biosimilars have already been around in Europe for more than 10 years. Um, since the introduction of the first biosimilar Omnitrump in 2006, Another 27 biosimilars in different product classes have been introduced on the European market, um, such as epotuins, uh, monoclonal antibodies in 2013, insulins in 2014, and 2016, last year, the anticoagulants uh, have also uh, in, been introduced as biosimilars. In the US, on the other hand, biosimilars have only recently been introduced, um, mainly because there are much more strict rules regarding the proof of the interchangeability between biologics and biosimilars. Well, with the launch of the first monoclonal antibody in uh, 2013, uh, infliximab, the market has become even more complex and challenging for the originator, originator biologics companies. How do these biosimilars impact the originator's business? How can the originator company add value? What price can the originator company still ask for the originator product? As more and more patents expire, uh, especially for monoclonal antibodies in the near future, and new biologics are also about to be launched, it's very important uh, to develop strong and effective strategies uh, to keep a position in the market. So, what is making these biosimilars so successful then? Um, as you may know, uh, the global spendings on biologics reached a record of $154 billion in uh, the year 2015. Um, with prices averaging 22 times those of small molecule drugs, it's really expected to reach $319 billion by the year 2020. Um, Biologics will be accounting for almost a third of the total pharmaceutical market and, and much of this growth is driven by the monoclonal antibodies. These types of drugs typically cost between ten and hundred thousand dollars per year. So knowing this, um, payers have been pushing back, um, applying measures that really control the use of biologics. In the UK, for example, cancer drugs like Progetta and Katsaila were rejected by the NICE because of their high price. And now with more and more biosimilars on the market, payers make strategic use of the growing availability of biosimilars. According to IMS Health, the usage of biosimilars can even lead to savings of up to $110 billion in Europe and the US through the year 2020. What we've seen so far from our research studies is that discounts on biosimilar prices average around 30%. However, we, indications from the first monoclonal antibody suggested even more aggressively uh, uh, an, a more an aggressive competitive landscape with um, extremely high discounts of 70% for infliximab and 50% discount for eternacept and this was something that we saw in Scandinavia. So price changes like this really prompt an immediate response from the originator manufacturer 
In Ireland, for example, Pfizer acted immediately on the price decrease of the biosimilar for Etanercept and lowered its own price of the originator product and rel to the same price as the biosimilar Etanercept offered by Biogen. So, price is really important. That's something that everyone knows. It's the most important driver for biosimilar prescription and therefore it's also very important to explore alternative pricing scenarios to understand the impact in new market situations and to de determine the optimal price level to retain market share um, and this is essential for the originator biologics companies. So, price is there but what other brand protection strategies are out there. Well, what we've seen in practice are uh, another few um, uh, methodologies or strategies that we've seen. So, the first one I would like to mention is brand power. With brand power, I mean leveraging on the originator's brand equity, um, the trust that physicians have, for example, in the efficacy and safety data, but also the evidence that's out there from the clinical practice that physicians have experienced for so many years already. Then value-added services is another one. Uh, by developing or improving support programs for patients, physicians, nurses, or other stakeholders, the brand's value proposition could be strengthened and helps to create differentiation. Then the last um, protection strategy I'd like to mention is innovation. Concentrating on either innovation as unique selling point or innovation in renewing the original original biologic that could benefit physicians and patients. Um, this could be, for example, an improved mode of administration or a more convenient dosing schedule that could demonstrate cost savings or strengthening its compliance. Um, from what we've seen so far, Roche has been uh, doing this in, for example, introducing an injectable versus IV formulation for their products, trastuzumab and rituximab and it enabled a much faster administration from 90 minutes to 5 minutes. So the stra these strategies I just mentioned focus specifically on what originator manufacturers can do themselves to protect from biosimilar uptake. However, there are also many external influences out there which can impact the biosimilar uptake. So let's have a look at these influencers. Um, so to prepare well for the introduction of the new biosimilars, gathering knowledge on who and what can influence the impact of biosimilars outside of the manufacturer is crucial. Based on our research studies, I believe the following aspects are necessary to build a robust forecast model to uh, measure the biosimilar impacts. So first of all, um, know your market. Who are your competitors? What new biologics and biosimilars are coming to the market? From which companies? and what clinical evidence do they have. So involving your competitive intelligence stream from an early on in your preparation is key to gain this information. Then second, who are the stakeholders that need to be taken into account? So <clears throat> what we've seen um, so far, um, there are multiple stakeholders um, involved. First of all, the payers. With payers, I mean hospital pharmacists or insurance companies. To what extent are payers mandating or advising the use of biosimilars? Then there are different national health organizations out there, such as the French National Authority for Health or the ICWIC in Germany. How do these kind of national um, organizations recommend um, recommendations and how do they translate into local policies? Then of course there are the physicians themselves or the key opinion leaders. How important are their usage endorsements to prescribe biosimilars? And last but not least, patients. Patients are becoming more involved when talking about their diseases and treatments. They're much more empowered nowadays. So how strong is their influence and what has that for what what is the impact on, on the biosimilar uptake? Then there's also uh, country-specific mechanisms that can influence, incentivize, or support biosimilar usage. For example, uh, national or uh, regional guidelines, for example. Uh, what we've seen in Scandinavia, for example, where rheumatologists um, have recommended switching, supported by financial incentive, increased market share to, 80, to around 88 and 96%. In countries where this was not recommended, 
uh, or encouraged uh, by any authorities, the market share stayed uh, until around 33%. Then there are also gain share agreements, uh, as employed for example in the UK. The cost savings that are made because of the prescriptions of biosimilars is shared between hospitals and the NHS. Another um, specific um, country mechanism is for example prescribing quotas. They can make a significant difference to uptake. Um, when, for example, the uh, biosimilar epitwins were introduced in, in Germany um, in one region, um, where they applied a quota. This resulted to a 56% higher market share compared, compared to uh, other regions in Germany. And then as last point I would like to mention the evidence generations um, as seen for example in Norway where the government funds clinical trials of patients switching from original to biosimilar to build confidence in usage. So understanding your market, knowing who to involve, and gaining insight in the specific country mechanisms will help to build a model that can measure the biosimilar uptake. But how can this be taken to, into account in a market research situation? So what I would like to do now is to illustrate um, a, a case study where we've done this. Um, I hope everyone is still with me and um, let's move on. So, how to measure this, the biosimilar uptake? So there are multiple approaches for measuring this impact. Um, the approach we used in this example was a patient allocation based conjoint methodology. Um, conjoint is a methodology that is used to understand how trade-offs between different product characteristics are made and the impact these trade-offs would have on the uptake of a product. Um, it's a very powerful technique to evaluate products that have not been launched on the market yet and which have various possible outcome scenarios. So in this example, um, the product profile of the biosimilar that was shown to and evaluated by physicians in an online survey contained a fixed and a variable part. As I mentioned already in the beginning of this webinar, biosimilars are similar to its originated product. Therefore, the fixed part of the product profile contained comparable information with regards to mode of action, administration form, indication, efficacy and safety data um, compared to its originated product. The variable part of the biosimilar product profile is the most challenging part, since this is the part that should give you a good representation of the biosimilar characteristics that can influence the uptake in the market. Um, in the example that I'm showing you here, and the following aspects were taken into account. So we had price relative to originated product. And uh, what we showed here there is the relative price. Um, we did that specifically because we've learned from previous studies that physicians are less price aware than, for example, payers. So for them, it's much easier to understand a relative uh, price. And we showed them six different levels from 10% cheaper to 60% cheaper. Uh, we did it also based on what we've learned um, from previous research, uh, knowing that there is a big differentiation in the possible um, um, uh, discounts that, uh, that are out there in the market. Then the endorsement from health authorities. Um, so also what, we've, what I've mentioned earlier, um, different health organizations can recommend this certain usage on either originator users or biosimilar usage. So take this into account in the biosimilar product profile is something that we did here as well. Um, then their clinical data. Um, with clinical data we mean specifically um, having having data, have, having efficacy and safety data comparable with originator product, but this could be in different settings. So for example in this in rheumatology um, we took into account a uh, first line setting and a second line setting or either that clinical data was available in first and second line uh, uh, setting. Um, for example, in oncology, um, in breast cancer, for example, you could take into account an early uh, breast cancer setting or a metastatic breast cancer setting. It really depends on um, the indication that you're uh, um, doing this research in. And then there's value added services. Um, like I said before, it could be a, a, a way of protecting from the originator's company. However, also biosimilar companies can uh, have a value added service in place, um, such as, for example, home care services 
or patient uh, support programs. Well, the aspects that I've shown here are not exclusive. Um, there are many more um, internal and external influencers on biosimilar uptake, as I previously mentioned. The ones that are relevant for you to take into account uh, in your model really depend on the countries where you want to measure the biosimilar impact in. So then how are we measuring the impact specifically? So we used a patient allocation with physicians. And since uh, the rheumatoid arthritis market is a rather complex one with recently launched products on the market and new products expected to be introduced soon, uh, we measured the uptake um, in three different steps. So first we measured the current market. So that was including the existing biosimilars on the market for infliximab and etanercept. And then um, the next step was to measure the impact of the future uh, new products, so including any new biologics coming to the market and of course the new biosimilar coming to the market. And for both steps we asked the physicians to allocate 100 new patients in their first and second line over all the available products. And then in the last step, the third step, we measured the impact of the different product characteristics and the price levels that I just showed you in the variable part. Um, and in this part, we really used the conjoint methodology where we randomized the different um, levels of the different product uh, characteristics. And, and uh, we asked them again to allocate 100 new patients in the first and second line over the available products and we asked them to do that multiple times to be able to get an insight in the patient shares. What I've also uh, told you earlier is that there are certain stakeholders that have uh, specific influences on biosimilar uptake. So um, what we've learned from our research is, was that especially hospital pharmacists could influence the physician's prescription enormously. So how to take into account this uh, pharmacist's influence then? So one of the approaches I'd like to introduce is including a choice exercise with hospital pharmacists in an online survey. Um, the approach allows hospital pharmacists to set a quota on the proportion of patients receiving the new biosimilar instead of the originated product. Um, this exercise provides overall quota outcomes per price level that we tested and these quotas can then be incorporated in the forecast model to see which prescribing patterns they influence. Uh, but besides taking into account stakeholders influences, um, I would also recommend to include an individual calibration factor for overstatement. And by overstatement, I mean that physicians often overestimate the proportion of patients that they would prescribe to a new product, um, primarily because they're excited of something new. Um, the individual calibration factor, factor can be uh, derived from respondents' answers to a seven-point Likert scale on the question, um, how likely would you prescribe this new biosimilar? And then the results of the individual calibration factor can be used to calibrate patient shares and can be incorporated in the forecast model. So let's have a look at the output results of such a study. So with the data from the survey, we can forecast the patient shares of the products currently available in the first and second line. Uh, we can model different market situations um, as shown in this graph where we have a scenario modeled where the biosimilar price would be 30% cheaper, there would be endorsements from health authorities to use biosimilars in all patients, the um, clinical data would be available in second line and there won't be, uh, would not be any value added to services in place. So what you can see here is then how the introduction of the new biosimilar gains share from almost all available products in the first line setting. So you have the current market, the future market for the first line, and then the second line, current and future market. And the gray box, the 34% and the 22% are the patient shares of the new biosimilar when coming to the market. And where you can see that they gain share from almost all available products in the market, in the current market. We also gained insight in the importance of the different variable product characteristics. So as I mentioned before, what we took into account in the variable part of the uh, product profile was price, clinical data, the endorsements from health authorities and, val uh, and value added services. 
So what you can see here is how important each of the different product characteristics are compared to each other and what level in levels influence behavior for each of the product characteristics separately. So as an example, price, for example, um, as you can see, has most impact on, uh, on the outcomes, which of course we would expect as well. Uh, but then you can also see what does it do with the patient share if you use a min minus 10% cheaper compared to the originated product or a minus 60%. So there's um, a big difference. So all of this information that we gather from a study uh, like this can be incorporated in a market simulator. Um, so this is one of the key deliverables that we usually give to our clients. The market simulator um, is an Excel-based tool and it offers you the opportunity to really simulate the, the impact of a wide variety of scenarios. Um, on the left side, you can, you can really change any of the aspects that were taken into account in the variable part of the biosimilar product profile. And on the right side, you can then see how the patient shares of all current and new available products uh, differentiate per scenario. So we've almost come to the end of this webinar. Um, to summarize, uh, the biosimilar market is a very dynamic market. So there are multiple strategies a manufacturer can take to protect from biosimilar uptake. However, to measure the uptake and develop an effective and strong strategy, a forecast study can really help to uh, better understand how the market will evolve with new products coming to the market. To set up such a study that can model biosimilar impact, I suggest you to take into account th these four uh, key learnings. So first of all, know who your competitors are and will be in the future. In the rheumatoid arthritis market, uh, we saw it's a fast changing market with new biologics and new biosimilars, biosimilars coming to the market. Um, you really need to keep that into account. And this is also what we see, for example, in other areas such as in oncology. Then second, know who and what influences biosimilar prescription. Um, physicians don't make the prescription decisions in isolation. As learned from previous market research studies, physicians are influenced by different stakeholders and therefore should be taken into account in your study. Um, then price. Price is really the main driver of biosimilar prescription, but it's not the only driver. And therefore, um, any country-specific specific mechanisms that can influence biosimilar uptake, um, such as hospital restrictions, quotas, um, they all should be taken into account. And as last point, use prices as percentage of standard of care. Physicians are not aware of prices of biologics or biosimilars, not at the same extent as payers ha um, have that knowledge. And therefore, actual prices do not work with physicians. A price relative to the standard of care is therefore much more manageable. Well, I hope I've given you some food for thought and on what is really important when dealing with biosimilar intro uh, introductions. Um, thank you for your attention.